Welcome. This is our third month in this series of talks. These talks are our way actually of finding meaning of the current issues that confront us in the situation of adversity. We give this as our blessing to the bigger society, blessings of insight, of creativity, and hope and courage. And I'd like to thank the faculty members of the Loyola schools and the professional schools who are participating in the series of talks this month for us. I'd like also to thank the University Research Council and the Ateneo Research Institute of Science and Engineering for putting together the talks. So again, welcome to Acts of Magis. Birds are built to fly. Fishes are built to swim. So too with our limbs and our upright stands, we humans are built to walk on earth, or to run, and thankfully, also to ride bicycles. We are called bipedal animals, not without reason. This is how Momok expresses his unified vision of his place in nature, his place in the city, his place in the cosmos. Ramon E. Barbaza, known to his friends as Momok, is an associate professor of philosophy and has served two terms as chair of the Department of Philosophy at the Ateneo de Manila University. He earned a BA in Linguistics from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, an MA in Philosophy from the Ateneo de Manila University, and a PhD in Philosophy from the Hochschule for Philosophie Murken. His dissertation, Heidegger and a New Possibility of Dwelling was published in 2003. His essay, There Where Nothing Happens, The Poetry of Space in Heidegger and Arellano, appears in Heidegger and the Earth, Essays in Environmental Philosophy. He is the editor of Making Sense of the City, a collection of essays from scholars in the humanities and the social sciences examining the city within the Philippine context, recently published by Ateneo de Manila University Press. He is a serious practitioner of Aikido. He regularly bikes the Luzon countryside with Team Loyola and is well recognized for his talents in photography. He shares his love and zest for life with lifelong companion Arlene Florendo Barbaza. They are married 22 years now. With much pride, the Ateneo Department of Philosophy brings you Ramon Momok Barbaza. Good afternoon and welcome to Acts of Magis, Athenians in the Service of Society. I'm Chris Caspilio, your moderator. We're happy to bring to you today uh, another first. No? Acts of Magis has been known to do a lot of firsts. And for this episode, we're bringing you our first presenter from the School of Humanities. Right? And I'm as you have seen in the video, uh, we have with us Dr. Ramon Momo Barbaza. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, how, have you, how have you been, sir? How are you? I'm good. I'm doing, I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Hope everyone also is doing well. Did you like your poster? I, I particularly like your poster. It could pass as an album cover. <laughs> I almost did not recognize myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. So, but of course, now, fine. And but we, we want to, to give you due service. After all, you are a, a photographer yourself, no? But of course, apart from that, what we are very excited to hear is uh, Dr. Momok's uh, presentation this afternoon. And so, we'd like to ask our audience members to please keep your microphones on mute and to kindly turn off your cameras for the duration of the program. We are coming to you live on two platforms. There's a G Meet, that is uh, where we have some guests here who can put in the comment sections later on uh, any of your questions or, or, or comments about the talk of Dr. Barbaza. But we're also coming to you live on the Ateneo FB, right? where you could also post your comments and we'll pick, some of, pick out some of them and share them with Doc Momok later on during the uh, Q&A portion. Of course, we'd like to thank our, our companions who have put together Acts of Magis, 
right? Namely, the University Research Council or URC and the Ateneo Research, Research Institute of Science and Engineering or ARISE. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Dr. Momo Barbaza. So thank you once again, Chris. Uh, thank you to the Ateneo de Manila University Research Council and also the Ateneo Research Institute of Science and Engineering. Um, and thank you also for the very kind introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for um, a conversation about our life in light of the pandemic. I want to invite you to a conversation that consists mostly of observations, descriptions, and from these observations and descriptions, perhaps we can draw some insights. And at the end, maybe we can become aware of important questions. So this is not so much um, a talk on solutions or finding answers to questions, but rather more of looking. I think you'd be surprised that at least the way I understand philosophy, uh, according to phenomenology, I like the way Heidegger uh, understands phenomenology as to let what shows itself be seen from itself just as it shows itself from itself. I, 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 that definition is so beautiful because there's not a single word there that has to do with thinking, but it's more of a letting, to let what shows itself be seen from itself just as it shows itself from itself. So I'd like to invite you to a conversation about looking. Uh, there's a saying in German, uh, erst sehen, dann denken. First, look, then think. Oftentimes, we rush ahead into thinking, into finding solutions, but not really looking enough. No. Even the word respect means to look again, especially then. No. And even, uh, you'd be surprised, even the word theory. You know, in Greek, theorem originally has nothing to do with thinking and the way we understand it today. But theorem means to contemplate, again, to see. You know. So that's what we'd like to do uh, this afternoon. And my, um, what I plan to do is to take up with you four points. The first one, how we talk about animals in everyday language. And then humans and animals during the pandemic. And from this, maybe we can draw some or consider some philosophical questions that have been raised and uh, confronted by thinkers and the entire history of thought. And finally, uh, by way of a conclusion, my own reflections uh, using a famous passage in the gospel, look at the birds of the air. So let's consider now how we talk about uh, animals in everyday language. Humans and animals. We're not quite sure what the end means. You can replace end with with, you can replace end with over to assert our superiority. It could be a war between humans and animals. It could be an identity. Humans are animals. Or the opposite, humans are not animals. Or we can say humans are not just animals. So we're not quite sure what to do with this relationship or how to understand this. You might have seen um, a video circulating uh, recently. Uh, those who were opposing the anti-terror bill, um, an adaptation of Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. And one part there says uh, in the 
the speech of the great dictator, you are not machines, you are not cattle, you are men. Uh, the, the character of Charlie Chaplin was uh, saying, and in the Filipino adaptation, it was Randy David who said that. Hindi kayo mga makina, hindi kayo mga hayop. In Filipino, uh, in English also, we speak of swine or swinery, baboy, kababuyan. And when we say that, we mean something negative, right? Or we say kahayupan. Ano naman kahayupan yan? There's not quite, I'm not sure whether there's some, uh, we don't say what animality is this, right? So it's probably more in Filipino when we when we say hayop, kahayupan. And then I saw this in a t-shirt uh, 20 years ago. There was a, I had a classmate, a lady from India who was wearing a t-shirt. And this is what was written on her t-shirt. Men are not pigs. We usually hear men are pigs. But then pigs are gentle and sensitive animals. So this is pro-pigs. So we are also animals, but not quite. Meaning, we don't know yet. We're not quite sure. The animals are there and we are here and we're not quite clear about who they are, what they are, and who we are in relation to them in our everyday language. Now let's take a look at the pandemic. This was, I think it's, I believe this was from the Atlantic and you can see sheep occupying a golf course. And you've seen similar uh, photos. Interesting that in the pandemic, what, what appears to be a restriction for humans, what we experience as restriction uh, is the opposite for animals. It's, they are liberated, they are set free. They are occupying again what we can say or consider what actually belonged to them originally, right? And uh, since my, one of my interests is the city, so we can see the city as the place from where animals are driven away, where the wild is kept at bay. In the city, we have animals only as pets or in zoos, right? Other than that, we try to drive them away. So the city is the place where animals are not welcome. But the pandemic welcomed them back. And we are the ones who are kept at bay. So the city can be seen also as a technology, as a way of doing things, of producing things that either drive humans or animals away depending on the situation and we see that in the pandemic the city as a way of living and we can reflect about how animals are affected by the pandemic how they respond to it and how this raises questions about us humans as well and the choices that we make right it's we're not quite clear about the distinction between city and province and there are many definitions, right? There's economic, there's political, there's philosophical, there is uh, existential, phenomenological or what have you. But one uh, understanding of the city that I found useful is this, that the city and the province this, uh, it's more of a spectrum of how far we have uh, gone away from nature. So if you see the spectrum, the city as the farthest from nature, and the province is a kind of an in-between. And then the furthest to the other end would be the wild, let's say the Amazon, let's say, right? the wild. So this would be a spectrum of how we have gone far from the natural state, whatever that means. Now, how did philosophers uh, throughout history 
how did they confront the question of our animality? Um, I'd like to share with you some passages from philosophy, from the history of philosophy, just to give us an idea how philosophers dealt with the question. Uh, there is Plato, who famously said, of course, what, what, what we know most or best from Plato is the passage which says the unexamined life is not worth living, right? Which Father Ferriol's uh, translated directly from the Greek to Filipino, which to me sounds even more powerful. Ang buhay na hindi kimikilatis ay hindi buhay tao. A life that is not examined is not a human life. No? Quite like what um, Charlie Chaplin and uh, Randy David was telling us earlier. Hindi kayo hayo. It's not a human life. No? And then also in another dialogue, he was saying, uh, this is in Crito, if I remember correctly, not life, but the good life is chiefly to be valued. The context of this was... Uh, Socrates was sentenced to death and his friend Crito was trying to save him from the impending death and Crito was so worried and it was Socrates was, was telling Crito, his friend, don't worry. It's not life. Not life itself, meaning animal life or plant life. It's not enough to just be breathing, to just be living, but the good life. So it's not so much whether it's long or short, but whether it's a good life, and that is what is chiefly to be valued. And of um, Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, quite like Plato, distinguishes the human being on the basis of reason. We share with plants something vegetative or nutritive. We share with animals uh, the function of perception, but it is reason which is unique to the human being and therefore we distinguish ourselves from animals on the basis of reason so this is so western the the, the primacy of reason and uh, john stuart mill uh, a famous passage uh, better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied uh, he was he was betting that no one will choose to be a pig on the condition that all your desires as a pig will be satisfied you you would rather be a human being even though you're all even though not all of your desires as a human being will be satisfied and whenever i i, I discuss this with my students i check i i test this and i ask anybody here would want or would choose to be a pig instead and be satisfied Usually, no one will uh, choose to be a pig. But I have had one or two instances when the two or three students would say, Sir, pagod na kami maging tao. We're tired of being human. We'd rather be pig uh, satisfied. And then, um, Heidegger, the one I work on for my PhD, um, famous for his idea of being in the world you know, saying that the stone is worldless animals are poor in world but humans are world forming and this was in his magnum opus 1927 being in time but in 1947 he also said of all the beings that are presumably the most difficult to think about uh, right next where I am. Oh, there's another one. Presumably the most difficult to think about are living creatures because on the one hand they are in a certain way most closely akin to us and on the other are at the same time separated from our existent essence by an abyss. So again, we're not quite sure where to place ourselves or how we are to understand ourselves standing in relation to animals. And then there's Derrida, who is known to be 
the father of uh, deconstruction and who loved cats. So the Jacques Derrida and his cat. We have dates for Derrida's birth and, de and death, but unfortunately no available dates of birth and death for his cat. And Derrida has this book. The translation was published in 2008, The Animal That Therefore I Am. Uh, I have just come across this book recently, so I still have to read through it. No, I just browse through it, but it's a fascinating book at first glance. No. And from the publisher, uh, Ford and Press, let's take a look. So those of you who have cats at home, if your cats are following you in the bathroom, you may be in for some philosophical reflection, like Derrida. So let's read the, from the, uh, the publisher. The book's autobiographical theme intersects with its philosophical analysis through the figures of looking and nakedness, staged in terms of Derrida's experience when his cat follows him into the bathroom in the morning. In a classic deconstructive reversal, Derrida asks what this animal sees and thinks when it sees this naked man. Yet the experiences of nakedness and shame also lead all the way back into the mythologies of man's dominion over beasts and trace a history of how man has systematically displaced onto the animal his own failings. So very, very interesting. For 2,000 years, we're not done yet. We're not done yet about the question of animality. But at least we know that the question of animality is so closely intertwined with the question of who we are as human beings. Now, now to my last part of our conversation, I, I wish we could have more time for uh, exchange and conversation. That's why I, I wish to cut this uh, w uh, shorter than the time allowed uh, that was given to me. So the last part, look at the birds of the air, which I used for the title of uh, this presentation. It, we all know that it comes from the, the gospel, and this is the version from Matthew. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Now, of course, we know the context of this is, is Jesus speaking to people who are worried about so many things. And he's telling them, why are you worrying? Just look at the birds of the air. Uh, I've been, I, I highly recommend, I've been watching uh, on Netflix, uh, Dancing with Birds. I, I highly recommend that. Um, it's, it's, it's an incredible documentary about birds in, deep in the jungle. Uh, if Papua New Guinea, if I remember correctly, and how the photographers, the videographers, patiently followed and documented how the birds, twig by twig, building not just a nest, but even a work of art. There was one bird, I forget uh, what sort of a bird it was. It took him seven years to build a tower in order to attract uh, partners. Incredible, right? Seven years. And yet, if you look at the birds, they don't have hands. They don't have, in, in terms of instruments, right? They only have their feet and their beaks. And yet, how incredible. Uh, when we were having a, a window in our home back in Quezon City repaired, uh, sadly, uh, there was a nest that was damaged. We didn't know there was a nest uh, right outside our window, and it was, it was damaged, and it fell on, on the ground, and it was destroyed, and I felt so sad looking at it. 
but then I was so amazed at the the design of the nest, right? I remember also uh, my wife used to teach in the Ateneo grade school, and there was an artist there who was. Uh, he passed away, I think, I'm not sure, a year or two ago, uh, Mr. Villanueva. And he was an artist, but he had many children. And with the teacher's salary, it was very, very difficult. And you know what, what, what inspired Mr. Villanueva? He said, it's the birds. If the birds can build nests, how much more I Now, this passage, look at the birds of the air, may sound too religious, too poetic for comfort. But if you look at it honestly, it's, it also makes a lot of scientific sense, right? I mean, all the, all the, all the calls we hear now, all the, the measures that we are being asked or enjoined to take part in, cutting down on carbon emission, simplifying our lives, buying local. If you look at all of these recommendations, come to think of it, what are these? You can summarize all of these into one thing, that we live our lives closer to what is more natural, that we become more like animals. Right? Because that's how animals live. Right? In simplicity, they, 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 they get and make use of what is within their area. So it makes a lot of scientific sense as well. Now, I'd like to share also with you what the sunbird taught me during the pandemic. Uh, in Quezon City, I live in a townhouse, and we have this vine called Nong Nuch. I think it's a Vietnamese word. Nong Nuch vine is right outside our main door. And because of the pandemic, we, uh, you've heard of people becoming more aware of birds and hearing bird calls and uh, bird songs. And it also happened to me. I became aware that this particular bird, I took this photograph. Th this is right in front of our house now. This is an olive back sunbird, you know, Cineris uh, jugularis. You know. And uh, ever since I became aware that they frequent our place because of the, the nectar of the non vine, I realized they were coming the all throughout the day, morning till afternoon. Uh, they, they, they are, they're little birds, and you can see here, you know, they're like, like, quite like a hummingbird. You know? And they're so light that they can, they can perch on even the tiniest of stems. And look at this, look at this, look at this bird. Let's look again at this now. You see the, the curved beak, the curved and long beak of the sunbird fits perfectly as if they're made for each other. The flower from which the nectar, from which the bird feeds now, from its nectar. And so they're made for each other. And so I was, I was struck by this sight that we don't really need to look far. We don't really need to go anywhere but to dwell where we already are. Just looking at the way we are physically, the way we are built, the way Birds are meant to fly. So it's a very sad thing whenever you see a bird in a cage, right? Or a fish in an aquarium. Because they're made, the fish are made to roam underwater. And the birds are meant to fly, right? Because they're built that way. 
And if we look at ourselves, we have powerful limbs. We have our legs, right? And so I find one of the most tragic things about our being human is how we get excited when we witness our babies make their first steps. Don't we, don't we get excited? But the sad thing is only for us to bring them up in a world that is hostile to walking, running, and riding our bicycles. Great artists have rendered this, this incredible moment. You see, you see here Van Gogh, uh, a painting from 1890, First Steps. Rembrandt also has a painting of the First Steps. You see how, how delighted, how excited, how happy we are at the sight of a baby making its first steps. But only tragically, sadly, to bring them up in a world like this. Isn't this so sad? Why are we doing this to ourselves? Right? One of my favorite scenes in the movie um, is this from Federico Fellini, Eight and a Half, 1963, the opening scene uh, of a traffic jam. It's, it's incredible how this was uh, imagined by Federico Fellini. It's an unforgettable scene. And if, if you think, uh, I, I've, I've written this in my piece in the Arete, uh, Katipunan is an area of young people, students, university, grade school, high school. You have UP, you have Miriam, you have Ateneo. And yet, how many young people do you see walking? In the university where I teach, in Ateneo, I see students lining up at the elevator just to go to the second floor or third floor, right? When they can take the stairs and use their legs, right? You have a free workout. You don't have to pay for a gym membership. Each day gives us opportunities to make use of our, what are given to us, like the sunbird, like the fish, like the animals. And so back to where we began. Humans and animals. We still don't know. What are we to do with this end? How are we to understand this end? If you think about it, it's really a question of measure. How far are we from animal life? Or how close are we to animal life? What's the measure of our lives? What's the measure of our humanity? You, you must have heard or read about for instance, as an example, the, the controversial uh, Kaliwa Dam, right? You have two proposals, one by the Chinese and the other by the Japanese. I can't remember now the figure, something like uh, 40 meters against 400 meters. The Japanese uh, proposal is very small compared to the Chinese. It's a huge dam. And if you follow the, the, ja the Chinese pro proposal, it will destroy an entire community which one is which which one is too much and which one is just right it's a question of measure of course beavers we know beavers also build dams but it's just right animals never do stockpiling unlike humans of course they also try to collect food, but just, just enough to tie them over the winter or a rainy season. But they never go beyond. Animals know their measure. It is us humans who are not quite sure 
what is the measure of our lives. And we can learn a lot from animals. Let me end with uh, two uh, philosophers. Uh, well, one is also a poet, Hölderlin, who was, who was trained as a philosopher, but was also known as a poet, and much older than him from the ancient period of Heraclitus. But first, uh, Hölderlin. Hölderlin said, is there a measure on earth? This is from one of his poems. And he answers it. There is none. There is no measure. But then he, he doesn't end there. For Hölderlin, poetry is the original measure. What does it mean? It's so poetic, of course. And here goes again another poet or philosopher uh, trying to play words with us. Just compare, for instance, the, the rice terraces and the nuclear power plant. Of course, the ones who built the rice terraces also did a lot of measuring, also did made use of technology, incredible engineering. Up to now, the, the irrigation system is still working. They must have done a bit of some science, some technology, and some measuring. But the rice terraces, when we look at them, they look beautiful. Maybe it's an example of just the right measure. And Hölderlin says, poetry measures the span between mortals and the divine. And if you think about it, all great works of art, poetry, songs, if you think about it, hidden in these works is our attempt to come to terms about this very difficult position we find ourselves in. We find ourselves between mortals and the divine, right? And that's why we say, when we are proud of ourselves, we say, ah, oh, we are human beings. We are not animals. We say that with pride. But then when we make mistakes or when we commit sins, we say, oh, I'm sorry. We're just humans. So we, we are ambivalent. Humanity makes us proud, but it also makes us guilty of our feelings because we find ourselves in this in-between mortals and the divine. St. Francis of Assisi, who is the patron saint of animals and ecology, perhaps we can also learn something from him. Letting the span between animals and humans and between humans and the divine be, to let this distance be, not to bridge it right away, maybe later, yet also bridging the distance and thus become one in interconnectedness and unity. The point is not to do away with the distance, but to respect the distance, the gap between animals and humans or between humans and divine. You know, all this fascination about superheroes, Batman, Spider-Man, all these are, are aspirations about the superhuman, right? They are divine. These are heroes. These are gods, right? The fascination about superheroes has to do with this span between humans and divine. The fascination never goes away. Now let me end with two fragments from Heraclitus, from the ancient period. He's, this is one of the fragments. Corpses should be thrown out quicker than dung. This is so scandalous if you look at it. I mean, how can you say that to somebody who just lost a loved one? Is he insulting the dead? It's not, even, it's not even a comparison between animals and between human beings and animals, but the, the dung, right? But I think if you look at this, there is a lot of wisdom behind this fragment that Heraclitus is seeing the unity of all that is in nature. And finally, you know, 
uh, my favorite uh, fragment, perhaps not just of Heraclitus, but of all time, is Fusis Cryptestai Philae, Nature Loves to Hide. There is much that the animal in us reveals about us, but there is much also that it, that it hides. We are invited to dwell within the play of concealing and unconcealing, between conspicuousness and hiddenness. In a word, we are being invited into what we may call a mystery. Thank you so much. God bless. Good afternoon again. And I hope we could have a, a good exchange after this. Thank you very much, Doc Momo. Uh, typically at this point, if we were all together in, in Long Hall, for example, I'm sure you'd be giving, you'd be receiving rather a lot of applause. But for now, uh, please look at your screen. I'll be giving you Acts of Magic Heart. Uh, thank you very much for that, Doc Momo. Uh, a Friday afternoon, indeed, is a good time for us to have these reflections. You know. um, earlier, you know, it, it, it was almost funny that you mentioned that there were there were chickens, you no, know, uh, clucking while you were doing your presentation. As I was listening to you, the dogs of the neighbor started barking. All right, and typically when we have acts of magic ongoing, that, that would worry me. All right, because of course, if we're coming live, we don't want many distractions. But because of what you had told, what you what you were sharing with us, I, I asked myself: Is the dog actually uh, being a disturbance to me, or maybe I am the one disturbing its dogness? It's just being a dog. <laughs> no, I want many other things. No, but uh, thank you, thank you for all these these reflections and invitations to reflections. No? At this point, we'd like to invite our, our audience who are in the GB. If you have any questions, please do put it in, in our chat area. We're also getting some questions from our FB Live. Uh, so we're getting the comments there. All right. And as Doc Momok mentioned, he, he would love to have some interaction with our, with our guests this afternoon. But so far, sir, at least from the live audience here in the chat, it's mostly applause. and, 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 and admiration for what you had just shared. So if I may, Doc Momok, uh, we gathered some questions earlier, and maybe this could add to the discussion for, for this afternoon. Um, I think many of us have seen that in terms of environmental reports during this pandemic, uh, it seems that the world is healing, and in quotes, no? uh, there has been less of, uh, uh, um, smoke emissions, you know, the, the sea seem to be doing much healthier than they were prior, all right? So that one question that we got is, so how do we return to a more environmentally healthy way of life, uh, given how much globally interconnected we are, and given how much interconnectivity uh, demands a great deal of natural resources anyway? So your thoughts, Doc Momo? Uh, that's a difficult opening question, uh, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. So if I, I, if I got your question correct, how do we return to a more uh, natural way of life, right? Is that your yes, question? Yes, sir. After since the pandemic has sort of healed the world while we're all uh, safe yeah. in our homes. No? But if we go back, how could we maintain, I guess, this kind of uh, harmony with, with the environment? Yeah. Um, At least um, thinking of Heidegger, for instance, right? Uh, his, his critique of technology, his critique of uh, agrochemical industry that has nothing to do really with feeding the hungry, right? Um, this, this call to return, to call to a return to a more natural way of life can be also misunderstood in many different ways, right? Uh, one way uh, one can misread, let's say, uh, Heraclitus 
or Heidegger or other environmentally inclined philosophers as you know, kind of a, a tree hugging <laughs> affair, <laughs> like we're going back to a hippie culture, right? Um, and we might be setting ourselves uh, for uh, disappointment. Uh, so, uh, just a, maybe a caution is even Heidegger himself is not telling us to return to a primitive way of life. He says that's not possible, that's not desirable. Yeah, it it's not even it's not even doing away with technology, right? Because we need technology. So technology is not the enemy, right? So. Uh, the question, how do we return to a more natural way of life? And I think that's what I tried to do this afternoon. Uh, before rushing into answering that question, is opening our eyes, observing, looking around us, right? And then take it from there. Uh, as in the example I, I gave, just watching the sunbird every day during the pandemic uh, without theories or, or philosophies in my or science in my head just just looking at it so yeah maybe uh, we can try again to exercise our capacity for looking, for listening, for becoming more attentive. And then we take it from there, step by step. Right? Thank you, Dr. Momo. That's a very good and very practical way of starting this, this journey and then this relationship with the environment. I'll take a question from from our G chat from Mr. Giovanni Escolano. Your thoughts, maybe the distance is our relation. The road is both distance and connection, related to distance between mortals and divine, human and animals. So sir, your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Giovanni Escolano, right? Uh, the one who raised the question. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, the distance is the relation, right? And uh, every day of our lives, we traverse these distances of near and far, right? Between human beings, between friends, but also uh, between us and other members of our natural environment, right? Th that's a very, very good uh, insight. The distance is a relation, no? And even I, I think Heidegger himself would agree. You know, in Being in Time, he said, the, human, the being of human beings is one of dead distancing. We can't, we can't seem to tolerate distances. So we try to bridge it. If the moon is, looks so far, we want to conquer it, right? Or from the Europeans, uh, you know, the, we are far. That's why we're called the Far East, right? And they can't stand the being far, so they colonize, right? So this relation is this relation is there, right? A relation, but we need to understand this relation in a way that allows the liberation of all, rather than subjugation or colonization. In my sabbatical, I spent. Um, I deliberately spent, uh, set aside time to go to Mindanao to visit Lumad communities, one in Bukidnon and another in uh, Davao Occidental. Uh, I visited uh, uh, a Lumad community called Tagataulu. And I was, and you know, I was fascinated. Uh, their, their term for God is Chumanum. Shumanum means the one who planted. Their relationship to God is the one who planted. So whenever they go to the forest to harvest, get anything, water, firewood, 
they they have a ritual of sorts asking for permission before they do whatever gathering and even those who are now have been assimilated into let's say the roman catholic church i've attended a catholic mass with where the tagafaulos the were there and they still use the word tumanum in in even in catholic masses but you see in in that word tumanum the one who planted is a relation right and it's so enraging you know, when we become aware that the lumad our 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 uh, indigenous communities are the one being deprived of the land that belongs to them all because of a paper a piece of paper right called land title but if you look at the animal world imagine you know i also do scuba diving and i'm so amazed underwater <laughs> you know the little nemo you know uh, they have a sense of a territory right and somehow they they do respect the territories without need for titles and and we saw that in the pandemic right our movements were restricted because of uh, you know private properties people who own private cars i I'm, I'm embarrassed myself because i live in a gated village and i know my village is restricting uh, movement right so we need to think about also property do we own anything really and what does it mean to own anything right so we can we can't do away with karl marx also right when he speaks of abolition of it sounds so radical but come to think of it right animals right and even christianity itself you know if, if you know your commandments only one thing is left sell all your possessions and follow me right so you know our being mortal wala naman tayong dad we know that wala tayong dadalhin sa kabilang buhay no? so all this uh tendencies to to occupy to colonize to possess you know, by way of private property you know, is 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 causing a lot of problems can we live in such a way that we are instead of restricting each other's movement can we live in such a way that we are liberating one another right? and that's the challenge i think thank you thank you for that doc momo uh, it also reminds me of, of uh, something i learned from another uh, faculty of ours from the school of humanities uh, dr bobby guevara uh, i learned from him to live simply so others may simply live sabi niya no? to live simply as so that others may simply live no? and, and i think that that resonates very much with, with your last point and uh maybe we'll give it the time we'll take maybe two more questions and we'll start with mr aaron de la cruzes uh also from the g chat he says is there a way to avoid the fate of gregor samsa who found himself transformed as a vile vermin right? your smile tells me already know this so in a neoliberal society that dissolves the human or the animal binary and transforms all beings as capital, right, or capital as it might be. So he's talking about the the workers of the day who are treated as if they're sacrificial livestock. So your thoughts, Sir Momo? Wow, uh, that's philosophy and literature in one. Thank you, uh, Aaron, for your your question. Um, you know, I was reminded. Um, uh, in my previous life, uh, uh, pardon me. Uh, in my previous life as a Jesuit, I had the privilege of living in Smoky Mountain for a month, and I remember there was one guy there whose name was Surut, and he didn't even know his real name. <laughs> and I asked him, "Why? Why is your name Surut?" And he said, "Because every time there is a police raid, he was known to be able to hide in the." <laughs> in all the darkest corners of the 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 of, of uh, smoky mountain <laughs> and and i was tr I, I i can't forget that no? uh, a human being who didn't even know his name anymore and who went by the name of uh, not even an insect that we are uh, 
we find cute, but, but we find despicable, uh, surut. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, workers who are being treated as if they are sacrificial livestock. I, I, I ask my students to watch uh, this documentary, Food Incorporated, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, please watch it. And you see what Aaron is saying is true, right? And the, the, uh, the ones who are supplying uh, chicken meat in, in the US, uh, one, of, one of the uh, contract, uh, contractors now, are saying uh, how the whole system is dehumanizing them and changing not just the chicken, but the farmer himself or herself. It's it, it, uh, incredible. No? We don't know this. Now we go to KFC, uh, Jollibee, and we eat our chicken, and we don't know how the chicken are produced and at what cost to human lives and to our dignity. No? So we need really to become aware of the sources of our food of our water, right? 80% of water from Manila is from Angat Dam. It doesn't get to us magically. Workers, there are workers there doing things, right? Maintaining machines and so on, making it happen, right? So again, uh, how do we avoid treating our, our fellow human beings uh, inhumanely? Again, is to become aware of who we are, that I am no, no superior to not just fellow human beings, but also to nature or to animals. And to become aware that we are interdependent. And, and when we become aware of that, of course, it sounds too mushy and too romantic, but there's also a lot of science behind that, right? That the more we are aware of the food that gets on our table. It does not get there by uh, magically. It gets there by way of labor and work and to, to examine how our food gets there and whether human beings are being sacrificed, as Aaron say, then we need to change a lot of things, right? Thank you, Dr. Momo. Well, I, I guess as, a, as, as an extension to that question, though, Sir PJ just mentioned that what wasn't Sansa's metamorphosis a retreat to animality as a way of avoiding the machinery of the workplace. So, who understands uh, the verwandlung, the metamorphosis? <laughs> what <laughs> I remember, you know what I. <laughs> What I remember from reading that, what struck me was the last scene. No? You know, the, the days when, when Gregor Samsa was lying in bed and couldn't do anything. You know, what's going on here? But the last scene when, when the, the family members got out of the house and then they see the traffic and you see how radically the shift from slowness, it's like business as usual. In a way, you can, I don't know, you, we can see the, the, the metamorphosis as, as, as in light of the pandemic. We can't go back to the old normal, right? If we go back to the old normal, we, are, we haven't learned our lessons, right? And I think that's, that's uh, at least to me, I, I, I don't know what really, I mean, who understands, right? Uh, there's, is there a definitive interpretation of, of Kafka's metamorphosis, but I, I remember how I was deeply struck by that last scene. When, when they, they went out and they breathed air again, and then they saw the, you know, the ordinary traffic again, as if, as if they're back to the everyday. When the point really is that we have to be stunned by something that should shake us out of our complacency, right? And reimagine a new normal. Thank, thank you, Doc Momok. And I, I guess as a close, as a final question, rather before we ask Doc Momok for his closing uh, message for us, uh, Acts of Magic started out with a series of talks that were directly related to COVID. You know? So we'll end with a question that is still related to our current situation. Uh, 
upcoming promise, uh, Jeanette Yasol Naval, right, also posted currently in our G chat. Uh, so first, she should thank you, of course, for your thoughts. No, but uh, I think the gist of her question is: so, how do you see our responses in relation to the pandemic and in relation to the animality in us? So, how have our responses to this pandemic? Uh, relate to the animality in us? How far close are we to the animal? Um, of course, that will, the answer to that will differ uh, depending on who it, who is the we that we are referring to, or is this the government, or is it the ordinary people, right? Uh, so there are different, I, I'm not sure what, uh, what, the one who raised the question, what uh, he or she was referring to by we. No? Um, but I don't know whether we can generalize, no? because we have, we, we have seen different responses, right? Even uh, among advanced countries like you know, Sweden, they, despite advances in science, they, they, they had different, res different responses. No? And, and yeah, so maybe that's why my answer no? E even with the same science, even with the same science, we can we can we can respond differently, right? We can have the same body of scientific knowledge, but we may end up responding differently. So the difference, I, I remember distinctly uh, Oliver Sacks, uh, the, the famed neuro a neurologist. Uh, uh, who said that doctors, medical doctors, should remember that they're not treating only uh, diseases of uh, human beings, but rather human beings with diseases. Right. So our, our response to the pandemic, uh, as I said, there are different ways of, uh, we've seen different responses. But my, my, my hope is that if we are to learn in our response is that we become more mindful, we become more attentive, we learn to listen more <laughs> to our surroundings because there's enough already you know, in our environment that will tell us you know, where to go, how to go, and how far, again, measure. You know. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Momok. Uh, I guess the thing about philosophy is we, we really can't quite allocate an hour just for it. It's something we would want to keep on doing it, but we apologize to, to our audience that we'd have to cut it short for now. Uh, but for sure, you know, the, the invitation that Dr. Momok gave to us to continue this reflection, to heed the invitations of observation, uh, will stay with us. No? But let's hear one more time from Dr. Momok. Any last messages, uh, sir? Um, uh, be well, everyone. Um, let us learn to, to be open to one another. I think that's that I, uh, the, the word I, I started with my, my lecture at the beginning, I said to look more intently, more closely. And the word even respect, especially has to do with look. So respect for human beings, respect for nature is about taking another look, right? So I would, I would if I may just repeat uh, this uh, German saying, erst sehen, dann denken. First look and then think. You know? Don't rush right away into thinking solutions. First look. You know? And then we'll take it from there. You know? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Herbert. Uh, and we'll take it from there. Thank you also. Thank you, um, thank you everyone. We'd like to thank... Yes, no. Uh, well, for, for, since I, it seems to me you know, there are a lot of fans with you this afternoon, uh, once we close the, the session, uh, if, for those who'd like to stay on board on the, on the chat, on the GV, you may do so and have uh, maybe five or so minutes with Mom uh, interacting. Uh, but for now, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us. This is the 10th um, episode of Acts of Magis. We're very happy that you have been with us 
been 10 weeks and we hope we have been giving you much uh, enlightenment, enlightenment on various topics. We'd like to take this opportunity to greet one of the core members of, of uh, Acts of Magis. She was uh, recently awarded uh, the 2020 National Academy of Science and Technology Environmental Science Award. All right. Doc Len Espiritu. Doc Len, congratulations. I know you're here in the meet. Uh, there, we're getting some, some uh, congratulations for you also. So together with so Doc Len is one of our, our guides, definitely, in doing Acts of Magic. And we just want to congratulate her also today. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. This is Chris Castillo, and this is Acts of Magic at Indians in the Service of Society. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you.